Gerald Rudolph Ford Jr. was an American politician who served as the 38th President of the United States from 1974 to 1977. Following the resignation of Richard Nixon, prior to this he served eight months as the 40th Vice President of the United States. Following the resignation of Spiro Agnew, he was the first person appointed to the vice presidency under the terms of the 25th Amendment, and subsequently the only person to date to have served as both vice president and president of the United States without being elected to executive office. Before his appointment to the vice presidency, Ford served 25 years as U.S. Representative from Michigan's 5th Congressional District, the final nine of them as the House Minority Leader. As President, Ford signed the Helsinki Accords, marking a move toward détente in the Cold War. With the conquest of South Vietnam by North Vietnam nine months into his presidency, U.S. involvement in Vietnam essentially ended domestically. Ford presided over the worst economy in the four decades since the Great Depression. With growing inflation and a recession during his tenure, one of his most controversial acts was to grant a presidential pardon to President Richard Nixon for his role in the Watergate scandal. During Ford's presidency, foreign policy was characterized in procedural terms by the increased role Congress began to play and by the corresponding curb on the powers of the president. In the Republican presidential primary campaign of 1976, Ford defeated former California Governor Ronald Reagan for the Republican nomination. He narrowly lost the presidential election to the Democratic challenger, former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. Following his years as president, Ford remained active in the Republican Party. After experiencing health problems, he died at home on December 26, 2006. Ford lived longer than any other U.S. president, question mark, 93 years and 165 days. While his 895-day presidency was the shortest of all presidents who did not die in office. Early Life Gerald Rudolph Ford was born Leslie Lynch King Jr. on July 14, 1913, at 3202 Woolworth Avenue in Omaha, Nebraska, where his parents lived with his paternal grandparents. His mother was Dorothy Air Gardner and his father was Leslie Lynch King Sr., a wool trader and a son of prominent banker Charles Henry King and Martha Alicia King. Nay Porter. Dorothy separated from King just 16 days after her son's birth. She took her son with her to the Oak Park, Illinois, home of her sister Tannis and brother-in-law, Clarence Haskins James. From there, she moved to the home of her parents, Levi Addison Gardner and Adele Augusta Ayer. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, Dorothy and King divorced in December 1913. She gained full custody of her son. Ford's paternal grandfather Charles Henry King paid child support until shortly before his death. In 1930, Ford later said his biological father had a history of hitting his mother. After two and a half years with her parents, on February 1, 1916, Dorothy married Gerald Rudolph Ford, a salesman in a family-owned paint and varnish company. They then called her son Gerald Rudolph Ford, Jr. The future president was never formally adopted, and did not legally change his name until December 3, 1935. He also used a more conventional spelling of his middle name. Ford also had three half-siblings from the second marriage of Leslie King, Sr. His biological father, Marjorie King, Leslie Henry King, and Patricia Jane King, born 1925. They never saw one another as children and he did not know them at all. Ford was not aware of his biological father until he was 17, when his parents told him about the circumstances of his birth. That year his biological father, whom Ford described as a carefree, well-to-do man who didn't really give a damn about the hopes and dreams of his first-born son, approached Ford while he was waiting tables in a Grand Rapids restaurant. 
The two maintained a sporadic contact until Leslie King, Sr.'s death in 1941. Ford said, My stepfather was a magnificent person and my mother equally wonderful. So I couldn't have written a better prescription for a superb family upbringing. Quote, Eagle Scout Gerald Ford, circled in red. In 1929, Michigan Governor Fred W. Green at far left, holding hat. Ford was involved in the Boy Scouts of America and earned that program's highest rank, Eagle Scout. Ford attended Grand Rapids South High School, where he was a star athlete and captain of the football team. College and Law School Attending the University of Michigan as an undergraduate, Ford became a member of the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity, Omicron chapter, and washed dishes at his fraternity house to earn money for college expenses. Ford played center, linebacker, and long snapper for the school's football team. During Ford's senior year, a controversy developed when the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets refused to play a scheduled game if a black player named Willis Ward took the field, even after protests from students, players and alumni. University officials opted to keep Ward out of the game. Ford was Ward's best friend on the team and they roomed together while on road trips. Ford reportedly threatened to quit the team in response to the university's decision, but eventually agreed to play against Georgia Tech when Ward personally asked him to play. In 1934, Ford was selected for the Eastern team on the Shriners East-West Shrine game at San Francisco, a benefit for physically disabled children. Played on January 1, 1935, as part of the 1935 Collegiate All-Star football team, Ford played against the Chicago Bears in the Chicago College All-Star game at Soldier Field. Ford remained interested in football and his school throughout life, occasionally attending games. Ford also visited with players and coaches during practices, at one point asking to join the players in the huddle. Following his graduation in 1935 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics, Ford turned down contract offers from the Detroit Lions and Green Bay Packers of the National Football League. Instead, in September 1935 he took job as the boxing coach and assistant varsity football coach at Yale University. Ford hoped to attend Yale's law school beginning in 1935. Yale officials at first denied his admission to the law school because of his full-time coaching responsibilities. He spent the summer of 1937 as a student at the University of Michigan Law School Ford earned his L.B. degree in 1941, later amended to Juris Doctor, graduating in the top 25% of his class. While attending Yale Law School, Ford joined a group of students led by R. Douglas Stewart, Jr., and signed a petition to enforce the 1939 Neutrality Act. The petition was circulated nationally and was the inspiration for the America First Committee, a group determined to keep the U.S. out of World War II. In the summer of 1940 he worked in Wendell Wilkie's presidential campaign. Ford graduated from law school in 1941 and was admitted to the Michigan Bar shortly thereafter. In May 1941, he opened a Grand Rapids law practice with a friend, Philip W. Buchan, who would later serve as Ford's White House counsel. U.S. Naval Reserve Ford responded to the December 7, 1941, attack on Pearl Harbor by enlisting in the Navy. He received a commission as ensign in the U.S. Naval Reserve on April 13, 1942. On April 20, he reported for active duty to the V-5 Instructor School at Annapolis, Maryland. After one month of training, he went to Navy Pre-Flight School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where he was one of 83 instructors and taught elementary navigation skills, ordnance, gunnery, first aid, and military drill. In addition, he coached in all nine sports that were offered, but mostly in swimming, boxing and football. 
During the year he was at the pre-flight school, he was promoted to lieutenant, junior grade, on June 2, 1942, and to lieutenant, in March 1943. Sea duty After applying for sea duty, Ford was sent in May 1943 to the pre-commissioning detachment for the new aircraft carrier USS Monterey, CVL-26, at New York Shipbuilding Corporation, Camden, New Jersey, from the ship's commissioning on June 17, 1943, until the end of December 1944. Ford served as the assistant navigator, athletic officer, and anti-aircraft battery officer on board the Monterey. While he was on board, the carrier participated in many actions in the Pacific Theater with the 3rd and 5th fleets in late 1943 and 1944. In 1943, the carrier helped secure Mackin Island and the Gilberts, and participated in carrier strikes against Kaving, New Ireland in 1943. During the spring of 1944, the Monterey supported landings at Kwajalein and Anawetic and participated in carrier strikes in the Marianas, Western Carolines, and Northern New Guinea, as well as in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Although the ship was not damaged by Japanese forces, the Monterey was one of several ships damaged by the typhoon that hit Admiral William Halsey's 3rd Fleet on December 18, 1944. The 3rd Fleet lost three destroyers and over 800 men during the typhoon. The Monterey was damaged by a fire which was started by several of the ship's aircraft tearing loose from their cables and colliding on the hangar deck. During the storm, Ford narrowly avoided becoming a casualty himself, as he was going to his battle station on the bridge of the ship in the early morning of December 18. The ship rolled 25 degrees, which caused Ford to lose his footing and slide toward the edge of the deck. The two-inch steel ridge around the edge of the carrier slowed him enough so he could roll, and he twisted into the catwalk below the deck. As he later stated, I was lucky, I could have easily gone overboard. Quote. Ford, serving as general quarters officer of the deck, was ordered to go below to assess the raging fire. He did so safely, and reported his findings back to the ship's commanding officer, Captain Stuart Ingersoll, the ship's crew was able to contain the fire, and the ship got underway again. After the fire, the Monterey was declared unfit for service, and the crippled carrier reached Alithi on December 21st before continuing across the Pacific to Bremerton, Washington where it underwent repairs. On December 24, 1944, at Alithi, Ford was detached from the ship and sent to the Navy pre-flight school at St. Mary's College of California, where he was assigned to the athletic department until April 1945. One of his duties was to coach football. From the end of April 1945 to January 1946, he was on the staff of the Naval Reserve Training Command, Naval Air Station. Glenview, Illinois, as the staff physical and military training officer. On October 3, 1945, he was promoted to lieutenant commander. Ford received the following military awards. The American Campaign Medal, the Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal with 9-3, 16, Bronze Stars, for operations in the Gilbert Islands, Bismarck Archipelago, Marshall Islands, Asiatic and Pacific Carrier Raids, Hollandia, Marianas, Western Carolines, Western New Guinea, and the Leyte Operation, the Philippine Liberation Medal with 2-3, 16, Bronze Stars, for Leyte and Mindoro, and the World War II Victory Medal. Post-war In January 1946, Ford was sent to the Separation Center, Great Lakes to be processed out. He was released from active duty under honorable conditions on February 23, 1946. On June 28, 1946, the Secretary of the Navy accepted Ford's resignation from the Naval Reserve.
Marriage and Children. On October 15, 1948, at Grace Episcopal Church in Grand Rapids, Ford married Elizabeth Bloomer Warren, a department store fashion consultant. Warren had been a John Robert Powers fashion model and a dancer in the auxiliary troupe of the Martha Graham Dance Company. She had previously been married to and divorced from William G. Warren. At the time of his engagement, Ford was campaigning for what would be his first of 13 terms as a member of the United States House of Representatives. The wedding was delayed until shortly before the elections because, as the New York Times reported in a 1974 profile of Betty Ford, Jerry was running for Congress and wasn't sure how voters might feel about his marrying a divorced ex-dancer. Quote, House of Representatives After returning to Grand Rapids in 1946, Ford became active in local Republican politics, and supporters urged him to take on Barnold J. Yonkman, the incumbent Republican congressman. Military service had changed his view of the world. I came back a converted internationalist, Ford wrote, and of course our congressman at that time was an avowed, dedicated isolationist, and I thought he ought to be replaced. Nobody thought I could win. I ended up winning 2-1." to one. Quote. During his first campaign in 1948, Ford visited voters at their doorsteps and as they left the factories where they worked. Ford was a member of the House of Representatives for 25 years, holding the Grand Rapids Congressional District seat from 1949 to 1973. It was a tenure largely notable for its modesty. As an editorial in the New York Times described him, Ford saw himself as a negotiator and a reconciler, and the record shows it. He did not write a single piece of major legislation in his entire career. Quote, in the early 1950s, Ford declined offers to run for either the Senate or the Michigan governorship. Rather, his ambition was to become Speaker of the House. Warren Commission On November 29, 1963, Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson appointed Ford to the Warren Commission a special task force set up to investigate the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. House Minority Leader Congressman Gerald Ford, MSFC Director Werner Von Braun, Congressman George H. Mann, and NASA Administrator James E. Webb visit the Marshall Space Flight Center for a briefing on the Saturn program, 1964. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson led a landslide victory for his party, securing another term as president and taking 36 seats from Republicans in the House of Representatives. Following the election, members of the Republican caucus looked to select a new minority leader. Three members approached Ford to see if he would be willing to serve. After consulting with his family, he agreed. After a closely contested election, Ford was chosen to replace Charles Halleck of Indiana as minority leader. In January 1965, the Republicans had 140 seats in the House compared with the 295 seats held by the Democrats. With that large majority, and a majority in the U.S. Senate, the Johnson administration proposed and passed a series of programs that was called by Johnson the Great Society. During the first session of the 89th Congress alone, the Johnson administration submitted 87 bills to Congress, and Johnson signed 84, or 96 percent, arguably the most successful legislative agenda in congressional history. In 1966, Criticism over the Johnson administration's handling of the Vietnam War began to grow, with Ford and congressional Republicans expressing concern that the United States was not doing what was necessary to win the war. Public sentiment also began to move against Johnson, and the 1966 midterm election saw a 47-seat swing in favor of the Republicans. This was not enough to give Republicans a majority in the House. 
but the victory gave Ford the opportunity to prevent the passage of further Great Society programs. Ford's private criticism of the Vietnam War became public following a speech from the floor of the House, in which he questioned whether the White House had a clear plan to bring the war to a successful conclusion. As minority leader in the House, Ford appeared in a popular series of televised press conferences with Illinois Senator Everett Dirksen, in which they proposed Republican alternatives to Johnson's policies. Many in the press jokingly called this the Evan Jerry Show. Quote, After President Nixon was elected in November 1968, Ford's role shifted to being an advocate for the White House agenda. Congress passed several of Nixon's proposals, including the National Environmental Policy Act and the Tax Reform Act of 1969. Another high-profile victory for the Republican minority was the State and Local Fiscal Assistance Act, passed in 1972. The act established a revenue-sharing program for state and local governments. During the eight years that Ford served as minority leader, he won many friends in the House because of his fair leadership and inoffensive personality. Vice Presidency Gerald and Betty Ford with the President and First Lady Pat Nixon after President Nixon nominated Ford to be Vice President. October 13, 1973. On October 10, 1973, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned and then pleaded no contest to criminal charges of tax evasion and money laundering part of a negotiated resolution to a scheme in which he accepted $29.500 in bribes while governor of Maryland. According to the New York Times, Nixon sought advice from senior congressional leaders about a replacement. The advice was unanimous. We gave Nixon no choice but Ford. House Speaker Carl Albert recalled later. Ford was nominated to take Agnew's position on October 12th. The first time the vice presidential vacancy provision of the 25th Amendment had been implemented, the United States Senate voted 92-3 to, to confirm Ford on November 27. Only three senators, all Democrats, voted against Ford's confirmation. Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin, Thomas Eagleton of Missouri and William Hathaway of Maine. On December 6, 1973, the House confirmed Ford by a vote of 387 to 35. One hour after the confirmation vote in the House, Ford took the oath of office as Vice President of the United States. Ford became Vice President as the Watergate scandal was unfolding. On Thursday, August 1, 1974, Chief of Staff Alexander Haig contacted Ford to tell him that, smoking gun, evidence had been found. The evidence left little doubt that President Nixon had been a part of the Watergate cover-up. At the time, Ford and his wife, Betty, were living in suburban Virginia, waiting for their expected move into the newly designated vice president's residence in Washington, D.C. However, Al Haig Presidency Swearing in Gerald Ford is sworn in as the 38th President of the United States by Chief Justice Warren Berger, in the White House East Room, while Betty Ford looks on. I have not sought this enormous responsibility, but I will not shirk it. Those who nominated and confirmed me as Vice President were my friends and are my friends. They were of both parties, elected by all the people and acting under the Constitution in their name. It is only fitting then that I should pledge to them and to you that I will be the president of all the people, my fellow Americans. Our long national nightmare is over. Our constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule, but there is a higher power, by whatever name we honor him, who ordains not only righteousness but love, not only justice, but mercy. Let us restore the golden rule to our political process, and let brotherly love purge our hearts of suspicion and hate. A portion of the speech would later be memorialized with a plaque at the entrance to his presidential museum. On August 20, 
board nominated former New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller to fill the vice presidency he had vacated. Pardon of Nixon President Ford appears at a House Judiciary Subcommittee hearing regarding his pardon of Richard Nixon. On September 8, 1974, Ford issued Proclamation 4311, which gave Nixon a full and unconditional pardon for any crimes he might have committed against the United States while president. The Nixon pardon was highly controversial. Critics derided the move and said corrupt bargain had been struck between the men. In the months following the pardon, Ford often declined to mention President Nixon by name, referring to him in public as my predecessor or the former president. Quote, when, on a 1974 trip to California, White House correspondent Fred Barnes pressed Ford on the matter, Ford replied in surprisingly frank manner, I just can't t bring myself to do it. Question mark. After Ford left the White House in January 1977, the former president privately justified his pardon of Nixon by carrying in his wallet a portion of the text of Burdick v. United States, a 1915 U.S. Supreme Court decision which stated that a pardon indicated a presumption of guilt, and that acceptance of a pardon was tantamount to a confession of that guilt. Draft Dodgers and Deserters On September 16, shortly after he announced the Nixon pardon, Ford introduced a conditional amnesty program for Vietnam War draft dodgers who had fled to countries such as Canada, and for military deserters. In Presidential Proclamation 4313, the conditions of the amnesty required that those reaffirmed their allegiance to the United States and serve two years working in a public service job or a total of two years service for those who had served less than two years of honorable service in the military. Administration Officials Upon assuming office, Ford inherited Nixon's cabinet. During Ford's brief administration, all members were replaced except Secretary of State Kissinger and Secretary of the Treasury, William E. Simon. Ford's dramatic reorganization of his cabinet in the fall of 1975 has been referred to by political commentators as the Halloween Massacre. One of Ford's appointees, William Coleman, as Secretary of Transportation, was the second black man to serve in a presidential cabinet, after Robert C. Weaver, and the first appointed in a Republican administration. Asterisk a vacancy by ascension briefly occurred for the position of vice president from August 9, 1974 to December 19, 1974 after Richard Nixon's resignation from office. Ford selected George H. W. Bush as chief of the U.S. liaison office to the People's Republic of China in 1974 and then director of the Central Intelligence Agency in late 1975. Ford's transition chairman and first chief of staff was former congressman and ambassador Donald Rumsfeld. In 1975, Rumsfeld was named by Ford as the youngest ever Secretary of Defense. Ford chose a young Wyoming politician, Richard Cheney, to replace Rumsfeld as his new chief of staff. Cheney became the campaign manager for Ford's 1976 presidential campaign. Midterm Elections The 1974 congressional midterm elections took place less than three months after Ford assumed office and in the wake of the Watergate scandal, the Democratic Party turned voter dissatisfaction into large gains in the House elections taking 49 seats from the Republican Party, increasing their majority to 291 of the 435 seats. This was one more than the number needed for a two-thirds majority, the number necessary to override a presidential veto or to propose a constitutional amendment, perhaps due in part to this fact. The 94th Congress overrode the highest percentage of vetoes since Andrew Johnson was president of the United States. Domestic Policy 
inflation. The economy was a great concern during the Ford administration. One of the first acts the new president took was to deal with the economy was to create, by executive order on September 30, 1974, the Economic Policy Board. Budget The federal budget ran a deficit every year Ford was president. The economic focus began to change as the country sank into the worst recession since the Great Depression four decades earlier. When New York City faced bankruptcy in 1975, Mayor Abraham Beam was unsuccessful in obtaining Ford's support for a federal bailout. The incident prompted the New York Daily News's famous headline, Ford to City, Drop Dead, referring to a speech in which Ford declared flatly that he would veto any bill calling for a federal bailout of New York City. Swine Flu Ford was confronted with a potential swine flu pandemic in the early 1970s. An influenza strain H1N1 shifted from a form of flu that affected primarily pigs and crossed over to humans. On February 5, 1976, an army recruit at Fort Dix mysteriously died and four fellow soldiers were hospitalized. Health officials announced that swine flu was the cause. Soon after, Public health officials in the Ford administration urged that every person in the United States be vaccinated. Other domestic issues In this land of the free, it is right, and by nature it ought to be, that all men and all women are equal before the law. Now, therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States of America, to remind all Americans that it is fitting and just to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment adopted by the Congress of the United States of America, in order to secure legal equality for all women and men, do hereby designate and proclaim August 26, 1975, as Women's Equality Day. As President, Ford's position on abortion was that he supported a federal constitutional amendment that would permit each one of the 50 states to make the choice. Foreign Policy Ford meets with Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev during the Vladivostok summit, November 1974, to sign a joint communique on the SALT Treaty. Ford continued the detente policy with both the Soviet Union and China, easing the tensions of the Cold War. Still in place from the Nixon administration was the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT. Ford attended the inaugural meeting of the Group of Seven, G7, Industrialized Nations, initially the G5, in 1975 and secured membership for Canada. Ford supported international solutions to issues. We live in an interdependent world and, therefore, must work together to resolve common economic problems," he said in a 1974 speech. According to internal White House and Commission documents posted in February 2016 by the National Security Archive at the George Washington University. Middle East In the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean, two ongoing international disputes developed into crises. The Cyprus dispute turned into a crisis with the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, causing extreme strain within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO, alliance. In mid-August, the Greek government withdrew Greece from the NATO military structure. In mid-September 1974, the Senate and House of Representatives overwhelmingly voted to halt military aid to Turkey. Ford, concerned with both the effect of this on Turkish-American relations and the deterioration of security on NATO's Eastern Front, vetoed the bill. A second bill was then passed by Congress, which Ford also vetoed, although a compromise was accepted to continue aid until the end of the year. As Ford expected, Turkish relations were considerably disrupted until 1978. I wish to express my profound disappointment over Israel's attitude in the course of the negotiations. Failure of the negotiation will have a far-reaching impact on the region and on our relations. 
I have given instructions for a reassessment of United States policy in the region, including our relations with Israel, with the aim of ensuring that overall American interests are protected. You will be notified of our decision. On March 24, Ford informed congressional leaders of both parties of the reassessment of the administration, policies in the Middle East, reassessment, in practical terms, meant cancelling or suspending further aid to Israel. For six months between March and September 1975, the United States refused to conclude any new arms agreements with Israel. Rabin notes it was an innocent-sounding term that heralded one of the worst periods in American-Israeli relations. After much bargaining, the Sinai Interim Agreement, Sinai II, was formally signed on September 1, and aid resumed. Vietnam One of Ford's greatest challenges was dealing with the continued Vietnam War. American offensive operations against North Vietnam had ended with the Paris Peace Accords. Signed on January 27, 1973, the Accords declared a ceasefire across both North and South Vietnam, and required the release of American prisoners of war. The agreement guaranteed the territorial integrity of Vietnam and, like the Geneva Conference of 1954, called for national elections in the North and South. The Paris Peace Accords stipulated a 60-day period for the total withdrawal of U.S. forces. The Accords had been negotiated by United States National Security Advisor Kissinger and North Vietnamese Politburo member Le Th. Cth? Question mark. South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thu was not involved in the final negotiations and publicly criticized the proposed agreement. However, anti-war pressures within the United States forced Nixon and Kissinger to pressure Thu to sign the agreement and enable the withdrawal of American forces. In multiple letters to the South Vietnamese president, Nixon had promised that the United States would defend Thu's government should the North Vietnamese violate the accords. In December 1974, Months after Ford took office, North Vietnamese forces invaded the province of Phu Ok Long. General TR and Van TRA sought to gauge any South Vietnamese or American response to the invasion, as well as to solve logistical issues, before proceeding with the invasion. As North Vietnamese forces advanced, Ford requested Congress approve a $722 million aid package for South Vietnam. Funds that had been promised by the Nixon administration, Congress voted against the proposal by a wide margin. 1. 373 U.S. citizens and 5. 595 Vietnamese and third country nationals were evacuated from the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon during Operation Frequent Wind. In that operation, military and Air America helicopters took evacuees to U.S. Navy ships offshore during an approximately 24-hour period on April 29-30, 1975, immediately preceding the fall of Saigon. During the operation, so many South Vietnamese helicopters landed on the vessels taking the evacuees that some were pushed overboard to make room for more people. Other helicopters, having nowhere to land, were deliberately crash-landed into the sea after dropping off their passengers close to the ships, their pilots bailing out at the last moment to be picked up by rescue boats. Many of the Vietnamese evacuees were allowed to enter the United States under the Indochina Migration and Refugee Assistance Act. The 1975 Act appropriated $455 million toward the costs of assisting the settlement of Indochinese refugees. Mai Guez and Pan Munjom North Vietnam's victory over the South led to a considerable shift in the political winds in Asia, and Ford administration officials worried about a consequent loss of U.S. influence there. The administration proved it was willing to respond forcefully to challenges to its interests in the region on two occasions. 
once when Khmer Rouge forces seized an American ship in international waters and again when American military officers were killed in the demilitarized zone DMZ, between North and South Korea. The first crisis was the Mayaguez incident. In May 1975, shortly after the fall of Saigon and the Khmer Rouge conquest of Cambodia, Cambodians seized the American merchant ship Mayaguez in international waters. The Americans killed during the operation became the last to have their names inscribed on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. Some historians have argued that the Ford administration felt the need to respond forcefully to the incident because it was construed as a Soviet plot. The second crisis, known as the Axe Murder Incident, occurred at Pan Moonjom, a village which stands in the DMZ between the two Koreas. At the time, this was the only part of the DMZ where forces from the North and the South came into contact with each other, encouraged by U. S. Difficulties in Vietnam, North Korea had been waging a campaign of diplomatic pressure and minor military harassment to try and convince the U.S. to withdraw from South Korea. At administration meetings, Kissinger voiced the concern that the North would see the U.S. as the paper tigers of Saigon if they did not respond, and Ford agreed with that assessment. After mulling various options the Ford administration decided that it was necessary to respond with a major show of force. A large number of ground forces went to cut down the tree, while at the same time the Air Force was deployed, which included B-52 bomber flights over Panmunjom. The North Korean government backed down and allowed the tri-cutting to go ahead, and later issued an unprecedented official apology. Indonesian Invasion of East Timor East Timor's decolonization due to political instability in Portugal saw Indonesia posture to annex the new state in 1975, just hours before the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, now Timor-Leste. On December 7, 1975, Ford and Kissinger had visited Indonesian President Suharto in Jakarta and guaranteed American compliance with the Indonesian operation. Suharto had been a key supporter of American influence in Indonesia and Southeast Asia and Ford did not desire to place pressure on the American-Indonesian relationship. Under Ford, a policy of arms sales to the Suharto regime began in 1975, before the invasion. Roughly 90% of the Indonesian army's weapons at the time of East Timor's invasion were provided by the U.S., according to George H. Aldrich, a former State Department deputy legal advisor. Assassination Attempts Ford faced two assassination attempts during his presidency, in Sacramento, California, on September 5, 1975. Lynette Squeaky, from a follower of Charles Manson, pointed a Colt 45 caliber handgun at Ford. In reaction to this attempt, the Secret Service began keeping Ford at a more secure distance from anonymous crowds, a strategy that may have saved his life 17 days later, as he left the St. Francis Hotel in downtown San Francisco. Sarah Jane Moore, standing in a crowd of onlookers across the street, pointed her 38 caliber revolver at him. Judicial Appointments Supreme Court In 1975, Ford appointed John Paul Stevens as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States to replace retiring Justice William O. Douglas. Stevens had been a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, appointed by President Nixon. Other Judicial Appointments Ford appointed 11 judges to the United States Courts of Appeals, and 50 judges to the United States District Courts. 1976 Presidential Election Governor Ronald Reagan congratulates President Ford after the president successfully wins the 1976 
Republican nomination, while Bob Dole, Nancy Reagan, and Nelson Rockefeller look on. Ford reluctantly agreed to run for office in 1976, but first he had to counter a challenge for the Republican Party nomination. Former Governor of California Ronald Reagan and the party's conservative wing faulted Ford for failing to do more in South Vietnam, for signing the Helsinki Accords, and for negotiating to cede the Panama Canal. Negotiations for the canal continued under President Carter, who eventually signed the Tory Hose Carter Treaties. Reagan launched his campaign in autumn of 1975 and won numerous primaries, including North Carolina, Texas, Indiana, and California, but failed to get a majority of delegates. Reagan withdrew from the race at the Republican convention in Kansas City, Missouri. The conservative insurgency did lead to Ford dropping the more liberal Vice President Nelson Rockefeller in favor of U.S. Senator Bob Dole of Kansas. In addition to the pardon dispute and lingering anti-Republican sentiment, Ford had to counter a plethora of negative media imagery. Chevy Chase often did pratfalls on Saturday Night Live, imitating Ford, who had been seen stumbling on two occasions during his term. As Chase commented, he even mentioned in his own autobiography it had an effect over a period of time that affected the election to some degree. Quote, Ford's 1976 election campaign benefited from his being an incumbent president during several anniversary events held during the period leading up to the United States Bicentennial. The Washington, D. C. Fireworks display on the 4th of July was presided over by the president and televised nationally. Democratic nominee and former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter campaigned as an outsider and reformer, gaining support from voters dismayed by the Watergate scandal and Nixon pardon. After the Democratic National Convention, he held a huge 33-point lead over Ford in the polls. However, as the campaign continued, the race tightened, and, by election day, the polls showed the race as too close to call. There were three main events in the fall campaign. Most importantly, Carter repeated a promise of a blanket pardon for Christian and other religious refugees, and also all Vietnam War draft dodgers. Ford had only issued a conditional amnesty. In response to a question on the subject posed by a reporter during the presidential debates, an act which froze Ford's poll numbers in Ohio, Wisconsin, Hawaii, and Mississippi, Ford had needed to shift just 11 votes in Ohio plus one of the other three in order to win. It was the first act signed by Carter. On January 20, 1977, earlier, Playboy magazine had published a controversial interview with Carter. In the interview Carter admitted to having lusted in my heart for women other than his wife, which cut into his support among women and evangelical Christians. Also, on September 24, Ford performed well in what was the first televised presidential debate since 1960. Polls taken after the debate showed that most viewers felt that Ford was the winner. Carter was also hurt by Ford's charges that he lacked the necessary experience to be an effective national leader, and that Carter was vague on many issues. Ford campaigns at the Nassau County Veterans Coliseum in Hempstead, New York on October 31, 1976 during the final days of the campaign. Televised presidential debates were reintroduced for the first time since the 1960 election. As such, Ford became the first incumbent president to participate in one. Carter later attributed his victory in the election to the debates, saying they gave the viewers reason to think that Jimmy Carter had something to offer. The turning point came in the second debate when Ford blundered by stating, There is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and there never will be under a Ford administration. Ford also said that he did not believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. As a result of this blunder, 
and Carter's promise of a full presidential pardon for political refugees from the Vietnam era. During the presidential debates, Ford's surge stalled and Carter was able to maintain a slight lead in the polls. In the end, Carter won the election, receiving 51% of the popular vote and 297 electoral votes compared with 48. 0% and 240 electoral votes for Ford. The election was close enough that had fewer than 25. 000 votes shifted in Ohio and Wisconsin, both of which neighbored his home state. Question mark. Ford would have won the electoral vote with 276 votes to 261 for Carter, though he lost. In the three months between the Republican National Convention and the election Ford had managed, to close what was once an alleged 33-point Carter lead to a two-point margin. Ford carried 27 states versus 23 carried by Carter. Had Ford won the election, the provisions of the 22nd Amendment would have disqualified him from running in 1980, because he had served more than two years of Nixon's remaining term. Post-Presidential Years Activity the Nixon pardon controversy eventually subsided. Ford's successor, Jimmy Carter, opened his 1977 inaugural address by praising the outgoing president, saying, For myself and for our nation, I want to thank my predecessor for all he has done to heal our land. Quote, Ford remained relatively active in the years after his presidency. He continued to make appearances at events of historical and ceremonial significance to the nation, such as presidential inaugurals and memorial services. In January 1977, he became the president of Eisenhower Fellowships in Philadelphia, then served as the chairman of its board of trustees from 1980 to 1986. During the term of office of his successor, Jimmy Carter, Ford received monthly briefs by President Carter's senior staff on international and domestic issues, and was always invited to lunch at the White House whenever he was in Washington. D. C. Their close friendship developed after Carter had left office, with the catalyst being their trip together to the funeral of Anwar el Sadat in 1981. Ford and Carter served as honorary co-chairs of the National Commission on Federal Election Reform in 2001 and of the Continuity of Government Commission in 2002. Like Presidents Carter, George H. W. Bush, and Clinton, Ford was an honorary co-chair of the Council for Excellence in Government, a group dedicated to excellence in government performance which provides leadership training to top federal employees. In retirement Ford also devoted much time to his love of golf, often playing both privately and in public events with comedian Bob Hope, a longtime friend. In 1977, he shot a hole-in-one during a pro and held in conjunction with the Danny Thomas Memphis Classic at Colonial Country Club in Memphis, Tennessee. He hosted the Jerry Ford Invitational in Vail, Colorado from 1977 to 1996. Ford considered a run for the Republican nomination in 1980, foregoing numerous opportunities to serve on corporate boards to keep his options open for a rematch with Carter. Ford attacked Carter's conduct of the Saltu negotiations and foreign policy in the Middle East and Africa. Many have argued that Ford also wanted to exorcise his image as an accidental president and to win a term in his own right. Ford also believed the more conservative Ronald Reagan would be unable to defeat Carter and would hand the incumbent a second term. Ford was encouraged by his former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger as well as Jim Rhodes of Ohio and Bill Clements of Texas to make the race. On March 15, 1980, Ford announced that he would forego a run for the Republican nomination, vowing to support the eventual nominee. After securing the Republican nomination in 1980, Ronald Reagan considered his former rival Ford as a potential vice presidential running mate. 
but negotiations between the Reagan and Ford camps at the Republican National Convention were unsuccessful. Ford conditioned his acceptance on Reagan's agreement to an unprecedented co-presidency. After his presidency, Ford joined the American Enterprise Institute as a distinguished fellow. He founded the annual AEI World Forum in 1982. Ford was awarded an honorary doctorate at Central Connecticut State University on March 23, 1988. After leaving the White House, Ford and his wife moved to Denver, Colorado. Ford successfully invested in oil with Marvin Davis, which later provided an income for Ford's children. In 1987, Ford testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee in favor of District of Columbia Circuit Court Judge and former Solicitor General Robert Bork after Bork was nominated by President Reagan to be an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. By 1988, Ford was a member of several corporate boards including Commercial Credit, Nova Pharmaceutical, The Pullman Company, Tesoro Petroleum, and Tiger International, Inc. In 1977, Ford established the Gerald R. Ford Institute of Public Policy at Albion College in Albion, Michigan, to give undergraduates training in public policy. In April 1981, he opened the Gerald R. Ford Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the north campus of his alma mater, the University of Michigan. In April 1991, Ford joined former presidents Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and Jimmy Carter in supporting the Brady Bill. Ford at his 90th birthday with Laura Bush, President George W. Bush, and Betty Ford in the White House State Dining Room in 2003. In October 2001, Ford broke with conservative members of the Republican Party by stating that gay and lesbian couples ought to be treated equally, period, quote, he became the highest ranking Republican to embrace full equality for gays and lesbians, stating his belief that there should be a federal amendment outlawing anti-gay job discrimination, and expressing his hope that the Republican Party would reach out to gay and lesbian voters. On November 22, 2004, New York Republican Governor George Pataki named Ford and the other living former presidents, Carter, George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton, as honorary members of the board rebuilding the World Trade Center. In a pre-recorded embargoed interview with Bob Woodward of the Washington Post in July 2004, Ford stated that he disagreed very strongly with the Bush administration's choice of Iraq's alleged weapons of mass destruction as justification for its decision to invade Iraq, calling it a big mistake unrelated to the national security of the United States and indicating that he would not have gone to war had he been president. The details of the interview were not released until after Ford's death, as he requested health problems. Ford suffered two minor strokes at the 2000 Republican National Convention, but made a quick recovery after being admitted to Hanneman University the hospital. On April 23, 2006, President George W. Bush visited Ford at his home in Rancho Mirage for a little over an hour. This was Ford's last public appearance and produced the last known public photos video footage, and voice recording. While vacationing in Vail, Colorado, Ford was hospitalized for two days in July 2006 for shortness of breath. Death and Legacy Ford died on December 26, 2006, at his home in Rancho Mirage, California, of arteriosclerotic cerebrovascular disease and diffuse arteriosclerosis. He had end-stage coronary artery disease and severe aortic stenosis and insufficiency, caused by calcific alteration of one of his heart valves. On December 30, 2006, Ford became the 11th U.S. President to lie in state. A state funeral and memorial services was held at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on January 2, 
2007. After the service, Ford was interred at his Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Citizens lining outside of the Daryl Dar Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids meet during a public visitation of Ford. Scouting was so important to Ford that his family asked that scouts participate in his funeral. A few selected scouts served as ushers inside the National Cathedral. About 400 Eagle Scouts were part of the funeral procession, where they formed an honor guard as the casket went by in front of the museum. Ford selected the song to be played during his funeral procession at the U.S. Capitol. The state of Michigan commissioned and submitted a statue of Ford to the National Statuary Hall collection, replacing Zachariah Chandler. It was unveiled on May 3, 2011 in the Capitol Rotunda. On the proper right side is inscribed a quotation from a tribute by Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House at the end of Ford's presidency. God has been good to America, especially during difficult times. At the time of the Civil War, he gave us Abraham Lincoln. And at the time of Watergate, he gave us Gerald Ford, the right man at the right time who was able to put our nation back together again. On the proper left side are words from Ford's swearing in address. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here the people rule. Quote, Ford's wife, Betty Ford, died on July 8, 2011. Like her husband, she was 93 years old when she died. Longevity The length of one's days matters less than the love of one's family and friends. I thank God for the gift of every sunrise and even more. For all the years, He has blessed me with Betty and the children, with our extended family and the friends of a lifetime. That includes countless Americans who, in recent months, have remembered me in their prayers. Your kindness touches me deeply. May God bless you all and may God bless America. Ford's age at the time of his death was 93 years and 165 days, making him the longest-lived U.S. president, his lifespan being 45 days longer than Ronald Reagan's. He was the third longest-lived vice president, falling short only of John Nance Garner, 98, and Levi P. Morton, 96. Ford also had the third longest post-presidency after Jimmy Carter and Herbert Hoover. Public Image President George W. Bush with Ford and his wife Betty on April 23, 2006. This is the last known public photo of Gerald Ford. Ford was the only person to hold the presidential office without being elected as either president or vice president. The choice of Ford to fulfill Spiro Agnew's vacated role as vice president was based on Ford's reputation for openness and honesty. The trust the American people had in him was rapidly and severely tarnished by his pardon of Nixon. In spite of his athletic record and remarkable career accomplishments, Ford acquired a reputation as a clumsy, likable, and simple-minded everyman. An incident in 1975 when he tripped while exiting the presidential jet in Austria, was famously and repeatedly parodied by Chevy Chase, cementing Ford's image as a klutz. Civic and Fraternal Organizations Ford was a member of several civic organizations, including the Junior Chamber of Commerce, Jaycees, American Legion, Ambets, Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks, Sons of the Revolution, and Veterans of Foreign Wars. Freemasonry Ford was initiated into Freemasonry on September 30, 1949. Honors Ford received the Distinguished Eagle Scout Award in May 1970, as well as the Silver Buffalo Award, from the Boy Scouts of America. In 1974 he also received the highest distinction of the Scout Association of Japan, the Golden Pheasant Award. President Gerald R. Ford Park in Alexandria, Virginia, located in the neighborhood where Ford lived while serving as a representative and vice president, 
President Ford Field Service Council. Boy Scouts of America, the council, where he was awarded the rank of Eagle Scout, serves 25 counties in western and northern Michigan with its headquarters located in Grand Rapids, Michigan.